right. God is good. Amen. How many people are excited that God had his word written down? Amen. Wow, that was horrible. All right, so God left a message for all of us, right? Amen. And it teaches us how to live. It teaches us how to love. It teaches us how to treat one another. It teaches us how to forgive one another. Amen. It teaches us how to grow in our faith. Amen. That's my Aunt Wanda getting ready to cut in front of me. How you doing? I love you. God bless you. I love my Aunt Wanda. She just had a hip replacement, and she's back and well. Praise the Lord for Aunt Wanda. Feeling better. For years, I used to t- tell her she was, she was my most favorite Aunt Wanda in all the world. And then one day, my cousin, her daughter, said, Mom, you know you're his only Aunt Wanda, right? So, but she still is my favorite Aunt Wanda. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful that you have allowed us to meet you in this place and in the power of your presence. And we're just thankful, Father, that we still get to see you at work. And so, Father, I pray that I not be seen nor heard today, but that you would be seen, heard, and working through me, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word, Father, that we would just hunger after it. And uh, your son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, said that, that his food was the will of God. And so, Father, I pray that that would such be our thought process today, that your word is our food to strengthen us, to encourage us. Father, that your will is our food, Father, to sustain us and to keep us going on the right path. And so, Father, we love you, and we are just thankful that you are going to teach us today by the power of your Holy Spirit, that your word is anointed, Father, because of you, and it's yours. It's your word. And so, God, we just give this service over to you, Father. Bless the children in the nursery and the workers and the teachers and the helpers, that every word that's sown in children's church today would not return void. But Father, I'm just so thankful. I'm just so thankful for the many volunteers that have surrendered their time and service today to serve you and our children. And so, God, we're yours. Use us today in Jesus' name and blood. Everybody said together, church, amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Amen. You may remember... From last week, uh, we, we studied a little bit from Acts chapter 17, and it's where some of the disciples of Jesus had been charged with the following statement, and this was the charge against them in Acts chapter 17. These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, amen, amen. Uh, I'd love to have that written on my tombstone if the Lord tarries and I go home before he returns, right? Like, what an amazing thing to be walking through a cemetery and you see a tombstone and you're just kind of looking at the dates and you know how you do when you cruise through a place like that and all of a sudden it says, wow, so-and-so, so-and-so, a man or a woman who turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Amen? Well, what a reputation, right? What a reputation... And this is what the disciples are charged with. This was their reputation. They've turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ. What a lifestyle. Here's the good news. Here's the good news, the amazing news. Every one of us has the opportunity, every one of us has the opportunity to live for Jesus Christ and turn the world upside down through Christ. Amen? And here's why, and we talked a little bit about this last week, and we're getting ready to go forward in just a moment, but just to refresh your memory a little bit. Here's why. Because the same power that was operating in those disciples is the same power that operates in us as disciples today. Amen? Okay, so just look at your neighbor. If you know they're saved, just be an encouragement. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a disciple. Amen? I mean... We have to understand who we are in Christ, right? We're a disciple. This isn't just something uh, back from the biblical days. We're living in the New Testament today. Amen? You remember in Revelation, he says, I'm coming back, right? I'm I'm coming back. And so 
the New Testament book has not stopped. We're still living the New Testament. Do you understand? We're still in that day, and we will until eternity starts. Amen? And then we'll be out of the Old Testament per se, and then we'll be into eternity, or out of the New Testament into eternity, and that's a new time. Amen? A new chapter, new story, new livelihood. Amen? And so the same power that was working in those disciples that turned the world, listen, the only way they turned the world upside down was because the power of God was in them. And there's some of you, maybe it's hard enough for you to just get dressed in the morning. You ever been there? Right? I mean, just raise your hand. How many of you just didn't know what you were going to wear? And wanted? It's just hard enough sometimes to get dressed, much less flip the world upside down for Jesus. And so we can't do that on our own. Amen? How many of you have walked up to a pantry full of food or a fridge full of food and you still didn't think you had anything to eat? Right? And your wife says, I just went to the store. And you're like, ah! And she says, well, you've got to put this with this and this with this, and then that's called dinner. Do something, right? And so we have everything that we'll ever need. My family's doing a, a family Bible study together. We just kind of pray and see as the Lord will lead us in, in the Word. And every morning we get together as a family and we read. That's one of the things that we were just reading uh, in Ephesians. Where in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, Paul reminds the church of Ephesus, he says, every spiritual thing that you've ever needed was given to you at the foundation of the world. Can we say amen to that? Amen. So whatever you're in need of today has already been granted at the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians, the first chapter, where Paul is writing to the church, and he's also writing to us, amen? And so spiritually, everything, spiritually now, Spiritually, everything that you will ever need has already been granted to you. It's just up to you to receive it in faith. You've got to believe that it's already been given. And so we pray with a thankful heart that what we're looking for has already been granted. Amen? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how we turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. I, I want to show you something. Go to Acts chapter 4, please, church, and let's, let's start off with the first verse. Uh, if... if, if you're sitting with someone and you notice they don't have a Bible, please be willing to share yours. Or uh, if no one in your area has a Bible, you can look along on the side screens and the scriptures will be up uh, in just a moment. To God be the glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. <clears throat> this is what the Word of God says, praise the Lord. And as they were speaking to the people... The priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And the Sadducees had a problem with that. All right, so look at what verse 3 says. And they arrested them. So all they're doing is sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they've just been arrested, verse 3. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. How many of you have ever been riding down the road and traffic hangs you up for just a few minutes and it just bothers you because no one else in front of you knows how to drive? You are the only one in the state of Virginia that knows how to drive and no one else knows. Yes, who are those people? <laughs> Can you imagine how these disciples felt? I mean, they're proclaiming the good news as they've been called to do, and they've been arrested, and they've been held up overnight. You reckon that put a kink in their plans? Well, let me just share something with you about the disciples of that day. That encouraged them. It fueled their fire. It fanned their flame to have been considered worthy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus. And now that happens and someone says, well, I'm leaving that church. They hurt my feelings. Right? Not, not oh, oh, this is a time of growth. This is a season of growth. Oh, I'm leaving. He preaches too long. I'm leaving. We don't start on time. I'm leaving. The music's too. I'm leaving. He's always stepping on my toes. I feel like out of everyone in here, he's always screaming at me. They considered it a blessing because they knew that God was loving them enough to teach them more. Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, you need more. 
say, I know, because I rode with you, right? But, and, and now look at that same person and say, I need more too, right? So look at it, verse 4. Uh, God's word is so good, amen? I mean, do you know that every answer you'll ever need is in this book? Yeah. Praise God, praise the Lord. Okay, verse 4. But many of those who had heard the word did what? Believe. Believe. So now it's getting really, really super good, okay? They've been locked up for preaching the gospel. Verse 4, but many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the what? The men. And so the women and children aren't even counted in this. Watch this. The number of just the men, just the men, came to about how many, church? And you think, oh my goodness, wow. But see, there was a movement of the Spirit of God. There was a movement of the Holy Spirit because the truth is being preached. Look at the fourth verse. Verse 4 tells us, Many who heard the word did what? They believed. Many who heard the word believed. What was the word? And I want you to think about this, and we're going to go a little deeper into this this morning. What was the word that caused those sinners to repent? What was the word that caused those sinners to turn to God? Verse 2 tells us, look at, look at uh, verse 2, Acts chapter 4, verse 2. Verse 2 tells us that they were teaching and proclaiming in who? Jesus. And so there's the power. They were teaching and proclaiming in Jesus Christ that there was life after death, that there was a resurrection from the dead. I want to show you again how Peter addressed the crowd. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, please, church, quickly. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 2, beginning with the 38th verse. God is so good, amen? Praise God. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Watch what happens right here. And, and Peter said, now we're looking at how they preach now. And Peter said to them, repent. Amen? And this is a message that unfortunately society has gotten away from because repent means to turn and go the opposite direction and when maybe you've got family members or maybe you've got co-workers that are enjoying the sin that they're living in, the last thing that they want to hear and maybe the hardest thing for you to tell them is, hey, you've got to turn from that. But listen, the message hasn't changed. And it never will change. The only way that we can live a life of victory through salvation in Jesus Christ is to turn to Jesus. And salvation is offered in no one else, but it's Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone that God has sent to the cross, paid the penalty, okay, by being the sacrifice, and he's the only way, he's the only way that we can come to repentance. And so God says that a man does not come unto myself unless I would draw him. And so this is how we allow the Holy Spirit to do a work in our lives, we offer the gospel message so that the Spirit of God can move in the moment and through that open door can draw a person unto himself. And so what God is calling his disciples to do today is the same thing, hallelujah, that he called his disciples to do then, to turn the world upside down. He's calling his church, he's calling the disciples, the body of Christ, to give a gospel message and say, in Jesus, you must repent. And because this is what happens when we don't share the repent message through Christ, they feel like they can receive Christ and still live like the world. You remember earlier, or last week, we, we talked and showed the scripture where the man came to see Jesus tonight, and he told the man, Jesus told the man, he said, you must be born again. And the man's just perplexed. He said, how can a man be born again? He cannot re-enter into his mother's womb a second time. And Jesus says, you're talking physical. I'm talking spiritual. And so there must be a rebirth. And so when we get saved, we can't look like we did before we got saved. We can't act the way we did before we got saved. We can't talk the way we did before we got saved. There must be a cleaning up. And here's the good news. You don't have to clean your junk. If you're willing to surrender to Jesus, he takes care of all that. That's how good he is, amen? So look at uh, verse 38, Acts chapter 2, the 38th verse. And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your what, church? For the forgiveness of your sins, 
and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are what, church? Far off everyone whom the Lord our God does what? (laughs) Calls to himself, verse 40, and when many other words, okay, with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, watch this, and there were added that day about how many church? And it all came from preaching the name of Jesus. See, this is why it was anointed, is because that was the plan of God, and it still is the plan of God today. It's only done through Jesus. It's only done, listen, you... You can be a lover of God, but if you're not following and being a lover of Jesus, then it's worthless. That's not God's plan. That's not God's design. It always, listen to this, always do not lead to God. All roads do not lead to God. It's only through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 with me, please, church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 look at the first verse please and look at what the word says here first Corinthians chapter 2 beginning with verse 1 praise God his word says this praise Lord and I when I came to you okay and I when I came to you brothers did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And so if you're here and you figure that you're not a, a, a good person of speech, well, I'm just a good old boy, or I'm just a good old gal, or I'm not educated, or I'm not smart, or I don't have a problem. I mean, we know that the Word tells us that, that Moses had a problem with his speech. I mean, just look at the work Moses did. Now, we know Aaron had to come along because Moses still didn't want to truly sell out to the will of God and what was going on. But still look at how God wanted to use Moses. And look at how he still did use him. So no one in this room, listen, everyone look up here. No one in this room has an excuse not to share the gospel with someone. No one. No no one's been granted an excuse. No one's been given an excuse. Doesn't matter what your problem is. Doesn't matter what your hang up is, what your holdout is, what you feel your issue is, what you feel your sin is. Now, this is a trick question, so don't get caught in it. Uh, How many people in this room are perfect by yourself? Raise your hand. Praise the Lord. Okay, then I don't have to preach for the next hour on that. Now, how many people know that we're perfect through Jesus Christ alone because of the blood of the Lamb, Jesus? Amen? And so everyone has something that we need to surrender and allow the Holy Spirit to do a change and a work. And when that's done, we got to look for the next thing that we've got to get better at and get get improve on and let go of sometimes. And so everyone needs to be proclaiming it. And so look what it says, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except who? And him what? Wow. So there's the power of God right there. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands were being led to the Lord. How? Because they had a big building? No. No. Because they were all filthy rich? No. Because they had prominence and fancy name tags? I'm the Apostle Paul. I'm Luke. No. It was because they had fancy speech and were educated men? No. According to that right there, it was because the only thing they longed to know was Jesus Christ and him crucified and said, that's what we teach. It all comes down to Jesus. For everyone else, it's okay to clap in this church. We can celebrate that Jesus paid the price. Amen. (laughs) We... (laughs) Jesus is alive, amen? Amen. And so his church should be too, amen? Okay, just want to make sure. (laughs) Some of y'all, I think, would be surprised if you showed up to a funeral service that I do. I 
we still don't treat it like a funeral service. If they're saved, they're in heaven, and we still celebrate. And the gospel message is, the gospel message is always given at a funeral service. So, so even at a funeral, we still have a good time. Ooh. Um, this may sound funny, but sometimes I enjoy funerals better than weddings. Doesn't that sound messed up? Doesn't it sound messed up to the average ear? But can I just tell you why? The last funeral I did, uh, when the man gave his soul to the Lord like two or three weeks before he died, and he was running, and he was angry at God. And you remember I shared that? God, God told me while I was getting in the shower, he said, go ask that man if he believes in hell or not, because that's where he's going if he don't get saved. And I go down there and tell him exactly what God told me to tell him, and he's just like, eyes as big as this, and he ends up receiving Christ, and then two or three weeks later he passes. Man, no greater joy than to stand here in front of his family and friends and loved ones and say, hey, that man that y'all knew is hard now gave his life over to Jesus, and we're going to celebrate because now he is in heaven with his father. Man, that's so exciting. See, I can't, you, you can't mess a funeral up for a man that ain't there no more. But for a wedding, there's a bride that's very present. Just saying. Some of y'all will get that on the way home. It's okay. We got to go on. Verse, verse 2, he says, for I decided, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, we're talking about how to turn the world upside down for Jesus now. Verse 2, he says, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And verse 4, watch this, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in what, church? Demonstration of the Spirit. In other words, that is you and me allowing God to do a work through us. Amen? That's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to love someone through you. Amen? That's allowing the Holy Spirit of God to, to, to work in you so that you can forgive someone and allow them to experience the forgiveness of God working through you and changing your heart so you can share the love of Jesus and say, I do forgive you. And he said that this is a demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God. And so he said, this is nothing that I'm doing. He says, I'm not even smart enough to come with you with educated words. But the only thing, and this is what I really like about it when you get deep into it, he says, the only thing that I desire to even know among you. In other words, I don't want to know your drama. I don't want to know your problems. I don't want to know nothing else that you got going on if it ain't pertaining to Jesus. Because for right now, he's the only one that can fix what you got so rather than talk about what's pulling you down, let's talk about the one thing that can lift you up and flip your world upside down. <laughs> Look at it, verse 2. He said, for I decided to know nothing among you. Whew. I decided to know nothing among you. It's talking to the church. I decided to know nothing among you, watch this, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other words, he said he's the only prescription in our life that we need to fix the soul problem that we have. The only thing that's going to change the problem with my soul is Jesus Christ alone, and that's it. You can have all the quiet time in the world, but if the Spirit of God's not leading it, it's worthless. You're wasting your time. Get up, move on. Hear that? Get up, move on. You're wasting your time. You're fooling yourself. Don't fool yourself. Invite the presence of the Lord to operate in your quiet time. Now you can sit there and ponder, and you can sit there and meditate, and you can do all of that, but if the Spirit of God ain't leading it, you're wasting your time. Invite the Holy Spirit in. Invite the work of the Lord in. Everything else, you're just thinking your own thoughts, and I don't know about you, but how many of us in this room got messed up thoughts sometimes? Right? How many of us in this room have, have been angry at someone before, not loved someone before, Right? Uh, think about it, as long as you're operating in your own thoughts in your quiet time, what good is that? You can't make you much better than you already are. You hear that? You can't make you much better than you already are. It has to take a movement of the Spirit of God. And because he says, be holy, because I am holy is what God tells us. Be holy, for I am holy. And so when we're in our quiet time, we need the Holy Father in our presence. We can't get any holier without him. We surely can't think clearly without him. We surely can't uh, hear the will of the Father without him working in our midst. So look at what it says. God's word is so good, isn't it? Look at, look at verse 3, praise God. It says, 
He says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom. Now hear that, because maybe there's some people in here that just feel like they're not educated enough. Maybe you feel like you don't know what to say, and we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But maybe you just feel like you just, you just don't know what to do. You just, you just, ah! It says, my speech and my message, verse 4, were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. One of the things that uh, people, when they come to church or when they first meet me, one of the things they'll say is, hey, where'd you go to seminary at? And I'll say, I, I never went to seminary. They'll say, well, how did you learn God's word? And I said, well, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will teach you everything in it. I say, well, who taught you how to preach? And I said, well, the Holy Spirit led me how to preach. Well, how do you know what to preach? Well, I just listen to the Holy Spirit every week, and whatever he tells me to talk about is what we talk about. And they just get perplexed up in the mind. They say, well, what do you think? You didn't go, uh, no. And so this is how that conversation went down. Uh, uh, the Lord called me into preaching in uh, my, the summer of my eighth grade year. In ninth grade, I began to preach. In tenth grade, I was doing things. In eleventh grade, I was sharing the gospel. In twelfth grade, I was sharing the gospel. One day in my senior in my senior year of high school, my dad walks into the room. He says, son, we've got to have a talk. And I said, oh, my goodness, what has he caught me in now? And he says, uh, your mother and I just want to know if you're going to go to college. And I look at him and I said, pop. That's why I call him sometimes. I said, pop, I didn't pay attention to free education. I don't think I'm going to pay attention to paid education. That is not a good example for our young people. <laughs> so do not use me as that goes. But that is the truth. And so my dad looks at me and says, great talk, son. We didn't have the money to send you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and a weight was lifted off of him, I'm sure, and a weight was lifted off of me and no pressure. And I just figured that as long as I was willing to preach and proclaim the name of Jesus, God would always tell me what to say, and he's been faithful to do it now for all of these years, and he will not stop as long as we continue to press into the Spirit of God. And so do not let Satan make you feel like you're not good enough, like you're unworthy. Do not listen and buy into the lies of the evil one. You know what you need to preach the gospel? You just need to open your mouth and share your heart. That's it. That's it. And God is so good. Amen. Verse 4. Amen. Verse 4. He says, And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but watch this now, this is where our faith is supposed to rest. That our faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but our faith would rest where, church? In the power of who? God. In the power of God. Go to Acts chapter 4, verse 5, please. To God be the glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Acts chapter 4, verse 5. Now watch what's taking place. This is right where we left off from where we started. Acts chapter 4, beginning with the first verse. God's word says this, praise the Lord, on the next day. Okay, so they've been in jail all night. Here's the next day. Remember, they're in jail because they've been preaching the gospel, sharing to how people can get saved and the resurrection. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family, verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired. And here they go. So they've set them in the midst of this group. And they say, by what power or by what name did you do this? Now they're talking about a man that had been healed. Verse 8, okay. Then Peter, filled with the power of what? The Holy Spirit, there's that working power. So here again is the demonstration in Peter's life of the power of God. Okay, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders. Okay, now stop right there because this is a big moment. 
This is a big moment for Peter. All eyes and all ears were on him waiting for his answer, according to the 8th verse. They've set him in the center. And everyone is gathered around. Then Peter, verse 8, look at verse 8. It says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. Now listen to this. Everyone look up here for just a moment. Peter needed a boldness in a word that was not his own. Peter needed a boldness and he needed a word that was not his own. I want to show you what Jesus has to say concerning this because for everyone that says, I don't know what to say. For everyone that says, I don't know how to do it. For everyone that says, I don't know when I should do it. I don't know what I should say. I don't know how I should say it. What do I do? What do I say? I want you to go to Luke chapter 12 and you're going to figure it out real quickly here. Luke chapter 12. It's really easy. And we're going to begin, church, with the 8th verse, Luke chapter 12, verse 8. And watch what happens here. I'm going to read five verses right here. Luke chapter 12, beginning with the 8th verse. And the word of God says this, praise the Lord. Watch this now. Remember earlier, uh, we just came out of Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. Peter had to say something, and it was not of his own. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. So watch this. Luke chapter 12, verse 8, praise God. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. Amen? That's everyone in this room. You acknowledge Jesus, the Son of Man. You acknowledge Jesus before men, and God will acknowledge you before the angels of God. That's a big deal. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And so watch this. He says in verse 9, But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. I don't know about you, but I don't want my name denied in heaven. And so if I want to be accepted and proclaimed, then I must proclaim Jesus. He's the only way. And the word of God says that he will then proclaim my name before the angels of God and yours too. Verse 10, watch this now. And who? Everyone. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be what? Forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now let me just tell you, it doesn't mean you can run out here and just forget Jesus every day of your life and it's still, still about to go to heaven. What that's saying is this, that no matter what you've done in your past, if you're willing to receive Jesus as your Savior, you can be forgiven right now. Amen? Doesn't give us a free pass to go live like the world every day of the week and then on Sunday roll back up in here and try to get it straight. Right? That's not a born-again life. That's living like the old you still wanting to not go to hell. Amen? Okay. I used, to, I used to play like that, and I've shared that, uh, this story, and I'll just share it quickly because it does go along. I used to, uh, I used to go to a community pool and um, didn't know how to swim. My parents would, y'all would just drop me off. Man, that was tough back then, wasn't it? Y'all would just, <laughs> I just realized that. We get dropped off, I couldn't even swim. Somebody said, well, you were probably three years old already. <laughs> so what I would do, they had lifeguards, though. They had lifeguards. So, so what I would do is, since I couldn't swim, I wanted to look like the big boys. So I wasn't tall enough to touch where the big boys swam, so I would, uh, I would go over to the baby pool that connected to the big boy pool. And I was, I was tall enough to be sticking out of there, like knee deep. What I would do is I would lay down and put my head up out of water, and I'd be like a crab. I'd take my fingers and crawl under my chest and make people think I was swimming. <laughs> and I'd just buzz around that thing like a motorboat all day long. <laughs> and, you know, I look back at that, how silly that is now. Like, how many grown people sat there and thought, that is so silly, <laughs> what he is doing. But sometimes I wonder how God looks at us and says, that's so silly. You come in here and look like church. Or come in here and check the box called church. And we come in here and talk one way in front of church, but then we go home and we got something else going on in the deep end. Or, you know, maybe, maybe your church Facebook page looks real good on Sunday because you came in the presence of the Spirit. 
And so that's the demonstration of God working in you. He convicts you to not do nothing foolish on Sundays, but Monday gets here and right back to posting the same old trash and same old verbiage and getting involved in the same old mix of who dads that ain't born again. And so we buzz around life trying to look like we're trying to keep out of hell, but when we line it up according to the text, we're on a one-way road where we don't want to end up. Maybe that hurts this morning for some folks, but it still doesn't make it any less of the truth. And see, it's serious business when it comes to the repentive heart. It, he says, just don't, don't come up in here playing games. Come up in here willing to change. Come in here willing to let the Spirit of God do a demonstration of His power in your life and, and working in you. It doesn't mean that we show ourselves off. What that means is, is that God reveals himself through us to the unsaved so that they could taste and see that the Lord is good and choose Jesus Christ for salvation themselves. That's what that's all about. It's about honoring the Father, not about honoring ourselves. It's about lifting up and exalting God, not about, doing it our, not about lifting up and exalting ourselves, not about doing it ourselves. It's all about God. And this is amazing. He says, uh, verse 10, we can get that on the screen. We're going to start there. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, now here's where Peter was. Remember, he had a big moment in front of everyone. And now watch this. Here's, here's how your big moment gets fulfilled. Here's how my big moment gets fulfilled. Verse 11. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, Jesus said what? Do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. Verse 12, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that what? Very hour what you what? Ought to say. So everybody look up here for a kind moment. You don't need to run and go get four years of seminary to learn what to say to someone about Jesus Christ. According to what Jesus himself said, he will teach you in the very hour what he wants you to say to that soul. Isn't that so? Can we just give God a clap of praise for that? <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise God. See, he will, he will teach you in that very hour. So for anyone that feels like you're not good enough to proclaim the name of Jesus, that's a lie that you've bought in from the devil. You've sold. He sold it to you. He sold you the lie, and you purchased it. Because you don't have to already be educated. Because the good news is the Holy Spirit of God will educate you in the very moment you stand there. So that means you don't have to wait another week to go share the gospel to someone. You can start it today and share whatever word the Lord places in your spirit. Amen? Amen. Look at, go back to Acts chapter 4. Go back to Acts chapter 4. Look what happens. We're going to finish up where we left off. Acts chapter 4, beginning with the 8th verse, right where we stop. Because in the 7th verse, remember where we left off, it said, they, they asked him, they said, by what power or by what name did you do this? Okay, so look at, look at verse, verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we, okay, now remember, he's, they've, they've circled around him. He says, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, okay, remember they had, they had healed him, okay, uh, God had used him to heal him. By what means this man has been healed, verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, not the name of Peter, he didn't want any glory in that. He says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Watch this now. Whom you crucified. Boy, he just really threw down the axe right there, didn't he? Now, who did Jesus say in Luke? Who did Jesus say would give them the words to say when they were before the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin? Yeah, now here it is. And so the Spirit of God, the work of God is working in the lives of these people, telling them, you crucified the Son of Man. He's holding them accountable. But watch this. I mean, this, this is amazing. 
Verse 10, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man is standing before you well. And this, Jesus, is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be, what church? Saved. When you walk in obedience and when you trust God's will for your life, the Holy Spirit's going to let you know everything that you need to do and say in every moment and every time. Peter boldly proclaims Jesus, and notice what he says concerning him. Look at the 10th verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 10. Uh, in the 10th verse, it says, By the name of Jesus, the man was made well. And look at the 12th verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Uh, also in the 12th verse, it says that there's salvation in who, church? No one else. Look at your neighbor and say, he's the only way to be saved. He says, for there is no other, verse 12, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So as Christians, the only thing that we need to be concerned about preaching and teaching is Jesus Christ and him crucified, and everything else is going to fall into place after that. But we can, listen, we could teach everything else and miss that one thing, and it do no good. Everything else is just a knowledge and a wisdom. But they must understand Jesus and what he did and how it affects us. Look at the 13th verse, please. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness, okay, and so we must be bold. That's the Spirit of God doing a work in us. Amen? Amen? Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were, what, church? Uneducated, common men. Raise your hand if you ever felt like that before. Or maybe you just know you like that, and that's okay. But look at what God did through the uneducated, common men. He built the church. Amen? <laughs> because of what God did through uneducated common men, you and I are here today. Amen? Now look at what takes place. He says that the crowd was astonished. They were astonished, and they recognized. Watch this. They recognized that they had been with who? I'm telling you, when you spend regular time with Jesus Christ, people around you are going to recognize that that's who you've been hanging out with. You ever walked into a, well, I'm not going to say no names. Let me just give you a perfect example. There's a gas station in this community, and when you, when you walk in it, you come out smelling like it. Anybody know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, just, it is what it is, but, you know. Um, the things that they do in the store, and they're, they're frying up foods, and, and uh, you know, when, when we're getting ready to go somewhere and we're riding in the car together, Eric will say, don't stop at that gas station. You'll come out smelling like that. We're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to go visit someone or, you know, uh, you just come out smelling bad. You know, food tastes great, but the smell is horrible. You know what I'm talking about? What I'm saying is this, that um, where you put yourself is what's going to rub off on you, whether you realize it or not. They say, no, 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 pastor, I'm, I'm good. I'm strong. I'm tough. You may be, but that's still not wise. You be good, you can be strong, you can be tough, but I'd rather you be wise. See, I, I love the wisdom of a Christian man or a Christian woman that's wise enough to say, I'm weak, I can't handle that, I better get out of here. Rather than someone that goes in guns a-blazing with no wisdom, and they're just out there, toosh, 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 hurting people left and right, ruining the opportunity for a future witness. Sometimes I've told Erica in the past, I said, no, no, I'll just run in there real quick. I'll run out real bad. I'm just fast. Pew, 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 pew. I won't, I won't stop. I won't talk to nobody. i just go get what I need to come right back out. And I've tried to do that, and you still come out smelling like it. But it's something that takes place. Look at it again, the 14th verse. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they said they had nothing to say in what? Opposition. If you go back to the 13th verse, it says in verse 13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Now everybody look up here for a minute. Maybe you're known as the joke of your family. 
But see, if you let God do a work in your life, no matter what you were known as, you have a future to be known as someone different. Amen? See, God loves to get the glory in that type of restoration. God loves to take the lowest of the low and do such a magnificent redeeming work in them so that when everyone who knew them looks at the change, they could say, oh my gracious, only God could have done that. Only God. How else could you, ex let me just show you something that you've been blessed to see and I've been blessed to see. I'm so humble about this. How else could we explain that so many people in this church have been healed from cancer or back problems or blood stuff or sicknesses and illnesses? We can't take any credit for that. Only God could do something like that. But see, that's the demonstration that's the demonstration what Scripture talks about. That's the demonstration of God's Spirit doing a work in that individual's life. That takes surrender and obedience. It takes dedication. So look at the 15th verse. Because understand this, when you hang out with the Lord, people go recognize that you've been with Him. Amen? They're going to feel the sweetness of the Spirit of God. They're going to feel the love of, of God coming from you. They're going to experience the forgiveness of Jesus in your life. They're going to see a boldness. They're going to see a joy. They're going to see someone who's an encourager and not someone who's destructive. Someone that will build up and not tear down. And so verse 14, but seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. Verse 15, verse 15, but when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, now watch this now, what shall we do with these men for that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and we what church? Verse 17, but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this what? You see, even the enemy knew that it was all about the name of Jesus Christ. Even the enemy knew that it was all about the name of Jesus Christ. Let me just ask you this, and this is not for our glory. This is not for my glory. This is not for your glory. This is for the glory of the Lord. If we boast, let us boast in Jesus. Amen? How many friends do you think you could get into church if you begin to share with them how many people God's healed here? You've got to come see this, man. You've got to come see this. Like every, every couple months, somebody's getting healed of something. How many family members do you think that if you just opened up your mouth about Jesus and shared what you've seen, just to share what you've heard, share the testimonies of the people that stood here, how many of them do you think would probably say, you know what, let me, let me just take a minute and just go see how crazy it is over there? Because to the unsaved, the Bible says to them it's foolishness. To them it's foolishness. But then when they come in and experience the love of God, it makes sense because he's drawing them unto him. And then it says this in verse 16. It said, we can't deny it. And in verse 17 it says, but in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. Verse 18, and so they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. You see, it's all about Jesus. Verse 19, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, he says, you must judge, for we cannot but speak. Listen to this. He's standing before all of these men. He says, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were doing what outside, church? They're outside. <laughs> They're all outside the jail, praising God. Whew. Remember, like 5,000 just got saved the night before, the day before. And there's people outside praising God, and it says that they couldn't punish them because of that. It's just they didn't want to create a mob. And verse 22 says, For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed 
was more than 40 years old. He says, what you tell me to do and not do is your business. But as for me, I can't help but teach and preach what I've seen and heard. And when our relationship with Jesus Christ becomes personal like that, not in education, but when our relationship with Jesus Christ becomes personal, we can't help but share with people what Jesus just did for us that day. Let me show you what he, what he, what he taught me. Let me share with you what, he, what, what he's showing me. Let, me. let me share with you what he's walking me through. Let me share with you what he's delivered me from. Let me share with you what he's healed me of. Let me just share with you how good he is. Let me just share with you how he saved me. Let me share with you what he did for me on the cross. And we're going to close with this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Please. Ephesians chapter 6. And, and we're going to begin. We're just going to read four or five verses here uh, in closing. Ephesians chapter 6. Look at the 16th verse, please. Watch this. This is, this is so beautiful. Paul writing here, he says, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Amen? And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what we've been reading this morning is the sword of the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Watch this, verse 18. Praying, how often? At all times in the what? Now, everyone look up here for a moment. I guarantee you, if we, as Scripture says, pray without ceasing. What that means is, is that all throughout your day, you don't hang up the phone with God. It doesn't mean that you walk around with your eyes closed at work. You know, just trying to find out where everybody's at. And I'm still praying. and Hey, I need these papers done, but I'm praying, so I'm going to need you to do that for me. And, uh, can't have lunch today because I'm praying and uh, you know, you just have bruises all over yourself when you come up here on Sunday. You probably wouldn't even make it, you know, throughout the first day. What it means is, is that you're always aware of what the Spirit of God is doing in and around you. And you're constantly in tune and constantly in communication. Now watch this now. Constantly listening to the voice of the Lord. Constantly listening to the prompting of the Spirit. So that in any given moment, if you're at the copier making copies and someone walks up and the Lord could just prompt you in your spirit and just tell you, place on your heart, hey, share my love with that person. And that whatever they're going through, let them know that I love them. Or maybe you're somewhere else and the Holy Spirit says, just encourage them today. Just encourage them. But we've got to be tuned in so we can clearly hear the voice and the call of the Spirit of God. So look at what it says in verse 18. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, and to that end keep what? Alert. Look at your neighbor and say, stay awake. And it doesn't mean we tape our eyelids open. It says keep alert with all perseverance. So in other words, when we're staying alert, We're receiving the strength of the Lord to do whatever we've got to do to press on in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of self, not in the will of self, but in the will of God in the name of Jesus. I'm alert and I'm pressing on and I've read my word today and I've spent time in prayer and I'm just watching like radar where I can be used next. It's so funny because the more you open up, to sharing the gospel, it will then become who you are. I, I have, and I'm boasting in Jesus on this because this is nothing that I do for myself. I had dreams about leading people to Jesus all the time. Uh, just last night I dreamed that I was leading two men to, to Christ in a store. That's one of my favorite things to do is just go in a store and just start asking people, do, they, you, know, do you know who Jesus is? Do you know who Jesus is? Are you saved? Do you go to church? Can I invite you to church? You know, it's one of my favorite things to do is just street evangelism. It's one of my favorite things to do. But just last night, I dreamt that I was in a store leading two men, one in a suit, one dressed really nice in jeans and a nice sports jacket. And I just remember it like it was just so real happening. It, it consumes you, y'all. It consumes you. It consumes you. When, 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 and listen, you don't have to be a title of a pastor 
to be consumed with wanting to share the gospel. That's being a disciple. That's being a disciple. When I meet people, I don't even tell them I'm a pastor because I don't want them to turn off the listening devices. You know what I'm saying? It says, to that end, keep alert with perseverance, making supplication for who? All the saints and also for me that words may be given to me and opening my mouth, what? Boldly, watch this. Opening that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. That's Jesus Christ, amen? To proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Watch this, he says, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. As I ought to speak. And so... And so we, we should not be ashamed or we should not question ourselves about sharing the gospel. It comes with a boldness because we ought to be doing it that way. Bold. You know that I'm a competitive person and if someone came up to me and said, hey, we got a, we got a, a, a flag football team. You want to come join us? I said, well, are you any good? I'm not going to waste my time with you. Are you good? You know, I mean, who wants to sign up for a loser, right? I mean, you know, I mean, if you could be on a team at 16 or 0 or 0 and 16, who are you going to pick? I'll take 0 and 16, please. We love to lose. No. I want to go on the side with a winner. And so when you approach someone and fearful, timid about this Jesus that saved your soul, no, 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 no. He said, be bold as you ought to be. And let them know what Christ has done for you and that you stand firm. And the reason we must be in perseverance and standing firm is because the world that's fighting for their soul is constantly pressing against them with no break. And so they must have another answer that is even more bold than the one that's been destroying them. And so it cannot come in weakness or timidity. It cannot be timid. But we must show the firmness of our decision in Christ as Lord. Let's stand and pray. Father, we're, we're thankful that you've allowed us to be in your word. And that you have invited us here in your presence. And you've allowed each one of us to get here safely. So for that, we're thankful, and we come with grateful and thankful hearts, and we're blessed because of it. And so we lift up our sister Joanne, and we're thanking you for her hip on her left side to be healed in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. We're lifting up our brother Earl, and we're thanking you for the answer of what we've already asked for that cancer in his stomach to be gone, and we're believing through faith that it is already. And it has to go. So God, we're just grateful that you are doing a work in this body of believers. I pray for every other church this morning. I pray, God, that it, if they're not serious about giving your word, that they will be. And for those that already are, I pray that you would just continue to encourage them, continue to bless them, continue to anoint them. It's so important that we need more and more and more churches proclaiming the true gospel of Jesus Christ and being firm with it as we ought to give it, as we ought to give it. So God, I pray that we would be open to your will being done in our lives. And before we leave here today, I just want to invite anyone that has not yet received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. You heard today the gospel message that Jesus came. And he died, but he defeated death, and he rose again. And the only way that you get to heaven is through Jesus Christ. You've also heard today that you must be born again. And maybe you've received Christ, but you haven't understood. You do need to be born again. But if you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord, I invite you to raise your hand right where you are if today's the day that you're ready to surrender and allow Jesus to get you on track where you need to be. And it would be an absolute honor me to be able to pray with you today if you're ready for that. Anybody here ready for salvation? Anybody here ready to surrender and just let Jesus 
completely take over in your life, tired of doing it on your own, and you're ready to have a demonstration of God's Spirit working in you. Praise you, Lord. Because that's what it takes. That's what it takes. Father, I pray for every person in this place that has been encouraged by your word, that we would go forth, that we would share and proclaim boldly the gospel message of Jesus as we ought to, that we would teach and preach and testify and proclaim and share all of the goodness of God in and around our lives. And Father, we're thankful for our sister April that has come forward a year later, a year later, so that we could all give praise to you that she's healed. And God, we just thank you, Father, for how good you are. Amazingly wonderful. In the precious name and the blood of Jesus, I ask that we would go forth in your anointing, in your care and control, that we would receive your honor as you say, those who honor you, your honor in return, 1 Samuel 2.30. And that God, that we would go forth in love, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's the only way that we're saved. In Jesus' name and blood, everybody said together, church, amen and amen. God is good. To him be the glory, honor, and praise, all of it. Amen. I love you, church. I love you. God bless you. Bring someone with you next week.